Hi there, welcome to the Bible study. I already had my first technical glitch. I was 15 minutes into this Bible study and had forgotten to shut the Wi-Fi off on my computer. My phone rings, it shuts, rings into my computer as well as my phone, shut everything down. So this is the second time I'm gonna try. Um, I am not unfamiliar with teaching online. Um, I helped introduce this when I was at the seminary. The technology has improved substantially and I'm hoping that you will find it as easy as I do um, once we get this under our belt. Um, as I indicated in an email to you earlier and um, in my message last Wednesday, uh, my goal will be to send you a 30 minute introduction to a particular section of the Bible that we're reading. I'll give you some uh, little deeper theology about what's happening. Uh, I'll give you enough meat to keep you chewing, I hope, uh, and um, also invite you to wrestle with what the text is saying to you. The intent will be then, after you've had a chance to read the text, listen to the video, that you will also be afforded the opportunity to join with me in a live online conversation uh, sometime within seven days of you receiving the video. I'll provide you with four opportunities, two days, two evenings, that you can simply log in. You'll have the login information on all four of the dates. You can log in and then join me asking your questions, hearing answers to some of the questions that people have already asked. In order to prep for that, I need, need you to read the text yourself because it takes too long for us to read it publicly. Secondly, if you do have questions after listening to this video and after reading the assigned passages, then I'm going to encourage you to email me those questions in advance so that the first thing I will do during um, each of our four gatherings will be to answer those questions. Because if you have them, chances are really good that someone else has them as well. I've chosen, we're going to begin this journey uh, reading the first three epistles of, uh, that are uh, accredited to John. They're short, they're an easy read, and I don't want you digging into deep theological texts like Hebrews or Romans or 1st and 2nd Corinthians uh, and have to wrestle through the technological issues as well. So for most of you, the technology will be relatively new, and I want you to grow comfortable in that because what we might find when this pandemic has begun to wane and um, we have the opportunity to continue to gather, we may find that for some people, gathering online will still be a better option. So we're going to read together the first three epistles accredited to John, I say accredited because nowhere in any of these three letters are, is his name included. Uh, the theology in the text is quite similar to the theology of the gospel accredited to John the Apostle. Uh, and the early church fathers assigned the name John to each of the epistles because they made sense. Um, it, it was in keeping with the approach to editing and canonizing the text. It has been argued that the John who wrote the gospel talked about the history of salvation. Same John in these epistles dealt with the issue of sanctification. And for those who happen to believe or think that the book of the Revelation was written by the same John, and that's a up for a lot of speculation, just letting you know that. Um, but the, those would we, we talk about, the, the author of the book of Revelation talks about glorification. So you've got salvation, sanctification, and glorification as possible theme, themes coming from the same author or someone at least who was in the same school of theology as the original John. John's epistles were written uh, to a community of people, probably who were in isolation. Oh, gee, here's another good reason for us to be dealing with John's epistle now. They were not able to be in regular community. They were in small groups, house churches, 
um, but they were dispersed around the Asia, or the area we know as Asia now, or, or the area particularly um, in, in the, the Tur where Turkey is now, um, Asia Minor, where the seven churches spoken of in the book of the Revelation um, were located. He was writing to encourage them. He was writing to deal with some theological errors that existed. Um, he was writing uh, to bring them into a lively relationship with God, and the Father, and with one another um, so that they might be positioned to be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the things that was high on John's agenda was not simply to sit, rest on the laurels of some theological truth, nor rest um, in the particular position of having been saved by the grace of God in the events of Holy Week and Good Friday and Easter Sunday. John was anxious that his readers live in the light, that they live in the presence of the risen Christ, ever aware of his presence with them. One of the things that uh, Deacon Jeannie and Mother Beth and I have um, been talking about it since the advent of the current stay-at-home encouragements is that many of um, many Christian believers have found it very difficult to be aware of the light of Christ in their own circumstance. They need to gather. There is an inherent longing in many of us um, to, to gather together so that we can meet Christ in one another. And oftentimes uh, it's in community that we're finally able to know the presence of the Father. But God's longing is that we know his presence everywhere. His light is present with us, whether we are in the grocery store or whether we're in worship on Sunday morning or whether we're in our own dens enjoying an adult libation. Christ's light and presence is there as is tra his transforming grace. One of the primary themes of John's epistle is the presence of Christ in light. He is the light, and he invites us to live in it. So one of the other themes of John's epistle is he is the righteousness, our, our right living, our, our ability to live lives that bring glory to God and that result in deep shalom peace within ourselves happens living in the presence of the righteousness of Christ. And, and it's in his light that we realize that ultimately we're unable to please God apart from him dwelling in us. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me, Paul would write. And, and as Paul understood this truth, so John also understood this great truth. Christ is our light. Christ is our righteousness. And ultimately and always, Christ is our love. And those three things we're going to hear over and over again in these, these three letters. He is our light. He is our righteousness. And he is our love. I encourage you um, to have already read the first epistle, uh, the first letter of the first epistle. It's very short. It's, it's only 10 verses long. If you haven't read it yet, pause this video right now. Sit down and read it out loud. I encourage you to read it out loud because being read out loud rings in our ears. We hear the sound of our own voice reading the biblical text. As you know, um, John begins his gospel in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, and this whole metaphor of God speaking Jesus into being um, is rich in those first 18 verses, particularly of John's Gospel, often referred to as the prologue. The epistle begins with similar metaphor. We declare to you what we... Um, what was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning what? Concerning the word of life. It doesn't say concerning Jesus. It says concerning the word of life. 
John writing in his gospel and John writing in this epistle recognizes that God breathes life by giving us his word. And his word now is being breathed into us. John's a, um, John is writing right from the beginning in this, to his readers to remind them that he has the authority to speak into their lives. He has the background. Uh, I can't speak into your life as a doctor of medicine because I don't know much about medicine. Although during the middle of this pandemic, a lot of clergy seem to have been ontologically changed into doctors and they speak with authority of some medical practitioners and scientists from the CDC. They haven't been changed, believe me. They're still clergy. Um, I, I don't know anything about medicine, but I can give you my credentials about the faith. I can give you my credentials about the Bible, which would encourage you to say, maybe we should listen to him a little bit more authoritatively about the biblical text than we listen to our next door neighbor. I don't know who your next door neighbor is, but I'm just saying that I've got some credentials that make it a little more um, uh, credible to listen to me about the Bible than to listen to some other people. And that's what John is doing in this epistle. He says, I've got some credentials. He said, I've heard him speak. I sat at his feet. I listened to him. I broke bread with him. I touched him. I know what he feels like. And I've seen him with my own eyes. I've got credentials. Listen to him. I'm a first-hand witness. Believe me, first-hand witnesses are a lot better than third-hand witnesses. You've played the game telephone. Uh, you know what it's like to start a story and see where it goes after five or six people have whispered it to each other often bears very little resemblance to the to the beginning um, and john is saying to these people uh, who have been struggling with theological truth by the way he's writing to a community of people who have been believing some errors some lies paul would write in one of his epistles that we have itching ears that are that long to hear things that make us feel good and John is writing to correct that very error. My credentials are, we've, I've heard him speak, I've seen him, I've touched him, it's the word of life, and this life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it. So, so listen to me, I've got the right to be heard. This life was revealed, we've seen it, we testify to it, we declare it to you, the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we've seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things to you so that our joy may be complete. We're wanting to engage in right relationship with you. If we all believe the same thing, we're gonna have better relationships. If we, we all don't need to set the table the same way, we don't need to dress in the same clothes, but we, if we have a common understanding of mathematics, if we all believe the same things about mathematics, then it's not gonna throw any monkey wrenches into the way we live our lives. Because when I give you change, it's gonna be the same way as when you give someone else change. If there's a common understanding about language and what words mean, we can communicate and have fellowship. If we have a common understanding of what God has accomplished for us in Jesus, then we have, um, we've got the same starting place. We, we can have a relationship. We can struggle with particular theological issues or with moral dilemma, but when we start with the same place in this relationship with Christ, um, then we're at least going to be able to be on the same boat. We're going to be on the same conversation. I'm in the middle of a conversation right now with a dear friend who left the Episcopal Church a number of years ago. Left for some theological reasons, now struggling with the fact that he made the decision to leave because he thinks maybe he was sold a bill of goods. He really didn't understand what was happening. But it doesn't matter because we still believe the same thing about Jesus. We know that he lived, he died, he's going to come again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We, we say this every Sunday morning in the Eucharist. And that's the testimony of John. And he said, we can have fellowship because of that. 
We can have fellowship because we're on the same page. You're on the same page? I think one of the things that uh, the ch this challenges me to ask is, what do I really believe? Do I believe the things that I want to believe or do I want to believe the things that the church believes? If I sat down with the apostles right now, would they find me on the same page as them? Or do I think I'm a little better than them because I've got more theological education than they've got? They were just fishermen and tax collectors after all. Do, do they, would we be on the same playing field? Are we playing the same game? I, I mean, I come from playing ice hockey uh, and that ice hockey stick doesn't do me much good in a football stadium. To call them both games would be accurate but we're not playing the same game if I'm playing ice hockey and somebody else is playing soccer or football. Am I playing the same game the apostles were playing? Am I in the, uh, on the same playing field? Do I have the same instruments? Am I believing the same thing? Or have I become a theological heretic? Have I developed a theology that promotes my pride it sets me outside the same, outside the tribe that John was inviting us to be a part of. This is precisely why he's writing this letter. He said, we declare to you what we've seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us, so that we can all be on the same page, so we can enjoy each other's company, whether in life or virtually. And that's one of the reasons that this whole letter was written because the people to whom he was writing were beginning to believe erroneous things. They weren't on the right page. And he wanted to have his joy complete because our joy is complete when we're in fellowship with others. When we're walking lockstep together, that brings us joy and power. And then he goes on. This is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness. God is light. In him there is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with God while walking in darkness, we lie. What does it say? What does it mean? And what are we supposed to do about things like that? Living in God living in the light of the Father, is living a transparent, vulnerable lives. It means that the darkness deep within me is being dealt with. It means the sin in my life is being shed. I've often likened my life to a garbage can. I apologize to those of you who have heard me use this metaphor before, um, but it seems to me that when I invited Christ into my life, he dealt with the things at the top of the can. I mean, if I'm sorting through a garbage can, um, I take the stuff out at the top first. And Jesus did this with the garbage in Jerry's life, the sin in my life. He dealt with from the top down. Now, now the farther, the longer I walk with Jesus, the more, the deeper he gets into this can of my life. And I don't know about the garbage cans in your house, but the stuff that's at the bottom of the garbage cans in my house are often packed together and they get mushy and sticky and it's hard to get it out, particularly because it clings to the side of the can. And the longer I walk with Christ, the more I realize that the darkness in my life, the sin, those deep unredeemed places of my life are areas that I've been hanging on to really tightly or that it becomes so incorporated into my life I don't even know I'm doing them. Uh, one of the things that I've become really cognizant of during this pandemic is how often I touch my face. I didn't realize I did that. And once we started live streaming um, on Sunday morning, I became really aware how often I stop and say, hmm, or um. We realize our bad habits. And that's what this text is about. This text is about me allowing the light of Christ to shine deep down within me so that the hidden darknesses, those things that I have learned to justify, the inconsistencies of my life will be dealt with. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. 
We are all sinners. But, but is, it, is it just necessary to say, yeah, I'm a sinner? No. It's I'm a sinner. Here's my sin. Now, Jesus, we're going to work on it together. I remember when Margie and I were first dating, I was still a smoker. And, and I loved smoking. I, I think I probably still would. I don't know. But I loved the pause that it gave me. When somebody asked me a tough question, I'd stop. I'd pull a package of cigarettes out of my pocket. I'd light the cigarette. And I would just stop and think before. And uh, well, one of the things I gave up when we were dating um, was smoking. Now, the cigarettes and the addiction to nicotine was relatively easy to deal with. Um, relatively easy to deal with. The thing that was most difficult for me was the psychological addiction to the pausing. I had no excuse to pause anymore and unless I became transparent and said, I'm just going to need a, a minute or two to think of before I respond. I didn't need to say that when I was pulling cigarettes out of my pocket and lighting them. I took the minute or two. But now I'm now I have to stop and articulate that. You learn a lot about yourself um, when you're challenged to make changes. And, and some people in my life who are close to me tell me that I'm really stubborn and it's hard for me to change. And it is. I am a sinner um, and I acknowledge I'm a sinner. But to continue to be in that sin, to continue to um, be refuse to do something about it, is amazingly wrong because if I see the light and I choose to walk in the light that reveals darkness in me and once I know the darkness I have a responsibility to deal with it now a good part of the rest of this epistle this letter is about understanding that inconsistency in our lives so for the next couple of days um, I invite you to honestly reflect on your own life and say, where are the inconsistencies? What are the things that the light of Christ might reveal into my life? What are the darknesses? What are the deep, dark areas that I've been clinging to or I might not even know about, but that need to be um, transformed by the light of the gospel? I invite you to do that. I invite you to go back and read this, this chapter of the epistle again. And realize that the light of Christ in all of its magnificence wants to dwell with you where you are right now. Want, he wants to dwell in you. He wants to dispel darkness. Because as darkness is dispelled, despair is dispelled. As darkness is dispelled, fear is dispelled. As darkness is dispelled, loneliness and longing are dispelled. Because the light comes to bring healing and joy and fulfillment and shalom peace. And my prayer for you as you struggle through this text is that you might know, all, might know all of those very things in your life. May God bless you. Write your questions down, email them to me, um, and uh, have a look at the email that this video comes with and you'll see the four opportunities we have to gather together and chat about John's epistle. God bless you.